Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. On behalf of uh, President Terry Road Larson and my colleagues in the African events teams, uh, it's really a very great pleasure to welcome you to this discussion, which is part of the African Leaders Series with Ambassador Aisha Abdullahi, the Commissioner for Political Affairs at the African Union. And I really, on behalf of everybody here, want to welcome you very warmly and thank you very much for joining us here this afternoon. Uh, uh, Ambassador Abdullahi has a very distinguished career as a senior Nigerian representative and diplomat uh, going back uh, seven or 10 years ago as commissioner in Bauchi State in northern Nigeria from 2004 to 2007. She was instrumental in resettling thousands of internally displaced peoples who had fled neighboring states as a result of ongoing ethnic and religious strife. I mean, that resonates with all of us right now with what's going on in both Nigeria and in uh, the Middle East. Uh, she played a similar, a really important diplomatic role as Nigeria's ambassador to the Republic of Guinea from 2008 to 2012, where she worked uh, tirelessly to resolve that country's complex political crisis in the aftermath of the death of uh, former President Lansana Conte. And in July 2012, so just two years ago, she was elected Commissioner for Political Affairs during the Summit of African Heads of State and Government in Addis Ababa. Uh, actually, Ambassador Abdullahi has an incredible background because she's also a scientist and a chemist. Uh, I learned this from your CV. Uh, she was trained as a scientist. She has a doctorate in organic chemistry. That's way above my pay grade. But uh, from Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa University in Bauchi State, I saw a photograph of him here in the United States 30 or 40 years ago, I, I think meeting uh, President Johnson. And she later was a senior lecturer at the School of Science and Science Education at the same university. Uh, given her really extensive academic and diplomatic experience, I really think that Ambassador Abdullahi is very well placed to analyze and assess ongoing efforts, ongoing efforts to strengthen democratic governance at the continental, regional, national, and local levels in Africa. Uh, over the past two decades, and especially since the inception of the African Union in 2002, uh, there has been considerable progress in strengthening democratic governance throughout the continent, including the conduct of many national and local elections in virtually every country on the continent. And the, the African Union is on record in the Constitutive Act of being opposed to coups and dictatorships. And countries subject to these events are suspended from membership in the African Union until they commit themselves to return to democratic governance. That, by the way, does not happen at the United Nations. So I think the African Union is ahead of the UN. It's not in the charter of the UN, what I just said. Uh, normative and institutional frameworks have been adapted by the African Union and the regional economic communities to advance human rights, the rule of law, free, fair, and credible elections, as well as sound political, economic, and social governance. But as you're all aware, implementation of these frameworks, however, remains uneven at best. And this really remains a major challenge for African leaders, for the African Union, and for a wide range of civil society organizations representing women, youth, unionized workers, farmers, and other groups. Um, we had the privilege, IPI, of being at a joint conference in Accra with your department, the Political Affairs Department of the AU in early August. Uh, 
where it was noted that despite marked progress in the area of democratic governance, the continent continues to experience democratic reversals in some countries, and as a result, accountable governance remained a significant challenge in several AU member states. And it was further acknowledged quite openly that effective governance, responsible leadership, and building solid political and economic institutions are the key to helping Africa meet its potential. And the absence of any of these capacities stalls con continental integration, unity, and prosperity. So we really have a unique opportunity this afternoon, Ambassador, to understand at first hand uh, the impact of these efforts that you and your colleagues have been making to advance and promote good governance, but also to examine more closely the structural and political constraints and obstacles to good governance in at least some African countries, and to understand more clearly the goals and objectives of your office. Um, so we really appreciate your readiness to share with us this afternoon your recommendations and insights on the way forward. I'd like to just add that these are not just African issues. And anybody who's reading the papers these days knows that the same issues are at the heart of the crises in the Middle East and in Europe and in the Ukraine and the Crimea. I mean, just kind of everywhere. So uh, Ambassador Abdullahi will speak for 20 to maybe 25 minutes. Uh, and then we will have an opportunity to have a discussion with all of you. So uh, again, thank you so much for being with us, and I'd like to just welcome you here, please. Good afternoon, and sorry to <laughs> drag you out from your lunch break. <laughs> yeah, excellencies, ambassadors, academics, civil society organizations, but most especially our distinguished moderator. Good afternoon. I bring you warm greetings from Africa, the cradle of mankind. I also bring you greetings from Ethiopia, the seat of the African Union Commission and the political capital of the African continent. I'm delighted to join you this afternoon to share with you our work at the African Union Commission on strengthening democratic governance through the African governance architecture, which we have codenamed AGA. Before I delve into the substance of my presentation, permit me to start off by extending my profound gratitude to the International Peace Institute for the partnership and collaboration with the Department of Political Affairs of the African Union Commission. In particular, I would like to recognize and acknowledge Ambassador Maureen Queen and her team with whom we've been collaborating closely and for being our gracious host. At the African Union Commission, we've made it our business to engage more robustly with think tanks and civil society actors. It's for this reason that we appreciate the excellent collaboration that has been cultivated over the years with the International Peace Institute. This is a true manifestation of this undertaking. Um, in the beginning, I would like to share with you, okay, okay. In the beginning, I would like to share with you the vision of the African Union, which is an integrated, prosperous and peaceful Africa driven by its own citizens and representing a dynamic force in the global arena. This is a very powerful vision. It's also a rallying point for all our programming. Today, we have developed various long-term development plans premised on this vision. This includes what is now known as the Africa Agenda 2063. Um, last year, 2013, the OAU, Organization of African Unity and the African Union, 
turned 50. And we felt that uh, we are where we are as a decolonized, united, and a rising continent because our leaders 50 years ago sat and had a vision for us. I'm alluding to the late Kwame Nkrumah, the late President Ahmed Sokotura of Guinea, and those Pan-Africanists of yesteryears. So we felt that we are duty bound to sit back and reflect on the Africa we want in the next 50 years. We are also working on the African common position on the post-2015 development agenda. Even the new Partnership for Africa's Development, NEPAD as it's called, was and it still is inspired by this vision. In pursuing this vision, we are inspired and enthused by the spirit of Pan-Africanism and African Renaissance, the twin ideologies that gave rise to the Organization of African Unity in the first place and shaped its transformation to the African Union. I hope and trust that we shall have a frank and genuine conversation I hope and trust once again that uh, I'm not here to just sing a story, but to tell you about a work in progress. I suggest that our conversation focuses on Africa's democratization record within the framework of the African governance architecture. But before we get there, let me briefly share with you what the Department of Political Affairs is all about. I might sell, I might sound like a salesperson. This may be so because I'm the Commissioner for Political Affairs and it's only natural for me to share with you what the department is all about and what its mandate entails. I do this so that you know who we, who we are, what we do, and why we do what we do. In this way, you can come on board with me as effective partners of the African Union Commission. The Department for Political Affairs that I shall be henceforth referring to as the DPA was established through the Executive Council decision, um, ex cl dec dot 34 and also another assembly decision, both adopted during the AU summit held in Maputo, Mozambique in July 2003. From inception, the strategic importance of the DPA as enshrined in both decisions is unambiguous. This is clearly illustrated in its principal mandate, which is to contribute the emergence of a political environment within and among African states, as well as the international level that is conducing to bringing about sustainable development and accelerating our economic and political integration. To this end, the DPA plays a prominent role in promoting, facilitating, coordinating, and encouraging democratic principles and the rule of law, respect for human rights, the participation of civil society, including the media, in the development process of the continent, and the achievement of durable solutions for addressing our humanitarian crisis. Specifically, the DPA sets out to one, advocate for and assists in ensuring that all African countries comply with agreed shared values instruments, and in particular respect, promote and protect human rights. Two, facilitate intra-African intra cooperation in political affairs. Three, consolidate and encourage the adoption of agreements and institutions, and set up also new democratic institutions. Four, encourage 
the emergence and consolidation of sustained popular participation throughout the continent. I don't think it's any different from what's happening here in America. <laughs> Strengthen and co consolidate existing institutions in the political field. Develop common political positions and mobilize international support for the African political agenda. Seven, encourage transparency and accountability in public affairs in political, economic, social, and cultural areas with greater involvement of the civil society, the media, and the private sector. Eight, devise ways and means of finding durable solutions for problems of refugees and addressing the causes and symptoms of humanitarian crisis. And eight, I think we are most known for this role currently to coordinate the AU election monitoring and observation missions in all our 54 member states. <coughs> in pursuing the above objectives, the DPA makes deliberate efforts to mainstream four main cross-cutting issues, namely gender equality, youth empowerment, minority rights, and four, climate change. The department is now 11 years old, and I happen to be the second commissioner. I took over two years ago. And uh, a brief about the African Union Commission. We are the only continental organization that is currently enjoying absolute parity. There are 10 commissioners. One of them is leading as the chairperson, another as the deputy chairperson, and then eight commissioners, five men, five women. And for the first time, the Continental Organization is led by a woman, Her Excellency, Dr. Nkoso Zana de la Minizuma. <laughs> Over the last two years, the DPA has focused its attention on the implementation of the decision of the uh, uh, assembly decisions, no executive council decision, which was endorsed by the assembly in February 2010. And in this, during this assembly, it called, uh, it was agreed upon that we must have a Pan-African architecture on governance and hence the birth of the African governance architecture. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me reiterate what economists are telling us about the exponential growth rates on our continent, even in the face of global economic recession. recession. The continent is indeed on the rise, but we must be careful in celebrating the Africa rising story because the phenomenal economic growth rates on the continent are also accompanied by deepening poverty, unemployment, and inequality. Thus, by and large, what we are experiencing is joblessness, unequal, and exclusionary growth, which is therefore neither sustainable nor transformative. Our economies are booming, becoming stronger, and intra-African trade rapidly increasing with the advent of numerous African multinationals. Increasingly, freedom of movement for people and services are increasingly gaining ground with the building blocks of the AU, namely the regional economic communities, playing a pivotal role in this regard. Overall, we've seen an Africa whose narrative has moved from the pessimistic characterization which made the headline of The Economist in 2001, which dubbed Africa as the hopeless continent, to the recent optimistic narrative of the rise in Africa, ironically by the same magazine in the year 2011. It's only fair to observe that in Africa today, there's an enormous amount of Afro-optimism, which has replaced that pessimism of the recent past. The so-called Africa of disease, we are still coping with Ebola, mind you, Famine and wars is increasingly being perceived as an emerging global frontier for development. Upon independence in the 60s, in the 50s and the 60s, 
Africa's democratization record was frankly a mixed bag, with few countries embracing the culture of democracy, while a majority adopted less democratic methods of governing. In, in that context, a small gr group of our member states of the then OAU experienced multi-party rule, while the majority governed through a military rule or one-party rule. In those decades, there were more military coups than multi-party elections. Today, following the developments and the transformation of the OAU into the African Union in 1999, the situation has changed significantly with respect to Africa's governance landscape. Since the late 80s, major strides have been made towards democratization. Unlike in the 60s and 70s, today there are multi-party elections, more multi-party elections than military coups across the continent. Put somewhat differently, today Africa boasts of more ballots than bullets. Africa is experiencing a relative peace dividend, political stability and democracy. The three imperatives of peace, stability, and democracy form an essential precondition for sustainable human development. Cold War induced interstate conflicts of the yesteryears years have receded substantially since the early 90s. We, still, we know that still South Sudan and Central African Republic are raging, in addition to uh, what we have been seeing in Somalia and other parts of the continent. But relatively, re relatively we've moved ahead. We have also dismantled apartheid in the Southern Africa region. And uh, today we boast as a decolonized continent. However, we've made, while we've made tremendous progress, existential threats of democracy persist. As mentioned earlier, we have the conflicts in Central Africa Republic recently there were ripples in the kingdom of Lesotho. We have Somalia, we have Mali, we have the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the ongoing conflict in South Sudan. The continent is witnessing the challenge of governance deficits, candidly, which remain at the root of violent conflicts in these countries. The coup attempt in Lesotho recently, in August 2014, is a vivid illustration of the need to further strengthen our work in addressing root causes of crisis on the continent rather than responding to conflict incidences when they finally break out. Your Excellencies, please permit me to share with you our analysis at the Commission on what we consider are the overarching causal factors for protracted and violent interest rate conflicts in Africa that in turn drill our development goals. I will highlight only seven. One, weak state institutions and able to exercise authority over their territorial jurisdictions. Two, given these weak institutions, provision of development and services to the people suffers thereby generating the crisis of legitimacy of the state. Three, the militarization of society and establishment of military formations that contest space with the formal security establish establishment, thereby generating disorder and near anarchy. Four, mismanagement of diversity through inter alia, politicization of ethnic identity and ethnicization of politics, which trigger interstate conflict. Five, mismanagement and contestation of our natural resources, which turns Africa's resource into a curse rather than a blessing. Environmental degradation and climate change, which in turn exert pressure on rural communities resulting in violent conflicts between pastoralists and farmers. And of course, I would add the eighth one, 
socioeconomic exclusion, inequality, unemployment, and marginalization. The AU, that's the African Union, acknowledges that these are the structural root causes that propel violent conflicts and instability on the continent. In addition to these root causes, we're also focusing our interventions on preventive diplomacy programs and activities. The emphasis is on developing and building strong democratic institutions, inculcating a culture of democracy and peace, promoting effective observance of human rights, constitutionalism and the rule of law, election monitoring and observation, but also preventing corruption and illicit capital outflows, and preventing humanitarian crisis and also providing durable solutions. All these strategies are essential for the promotion of sustainable peace, security, and development on the continent. I had mentioned the African governance architecture earlier, and uh, it was actually translate, uh, established to translate the objectives of the legal and policy pronouncements on AU shared values as the implementing framework for the promotion and sustenance of democracy, human rights, and governance on the continent. By the African Union shared values, we mean those values, norms, and standards as enshrined in the Union's various instruments, such as freedom, human rights. And we have to be careful here. When we talk about human rights on the African continent, we are stressing on the fundamental basic rights, like right to food, right to shelter, right to education, and the rule of law, tolerance, respect, community spirit, gender equality, youth empowerment, unity in diversity, constitutionalism, democratic governance, peace, security, stability, development, environmental protection, and the list goes on and on. The principal goals of the African governance architecture is one, to deepen popular participation, promote African shared values, foster implementation of the norms that our leaders agreed upon to, de to deepen synergy among all our activities with our organs and to facilitate assessments, monitoring and evaluation of compliance and the of the implementation of these norms on democracy and governance, and in particular, review of state reports as envisaged in Article 49 of the African Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance. But we also intend to generate knowledge and data and also facilitate joint engagement in preventive di diplomacy conflict prevention and post-conflict reconstruction and development associated with governance challenges in Africa. Through the African governance architecture, the union is facilitating the implementation support and complementing the efforts of African Union member states in paying respect to these norms that they had voluntarily agreed upon. To ensure coordination and synergy among all the various organs, institutions, and the RECs, we have what we call the African Governance Platform, which serves as a dialogue and information sharing forum for the achievement of the goals of the African Governance Architecture. It provides an avenue for consultations, coordination, dialogue, and collective action among the various African Union organs and institutions for lessons, learning, and experience sharing on how best to deepen democracy. Your Excellencies, the AGA is designed as a complementary framework for what we have as the African Peace and Security Architecture, codenamed the APSA, and also the African Development Architecture in the form of NEPAD. It's easy to understand why AGA complements the APSA and NEPAD democracy, peace, and development are inextricably interwoven in Africa. Democracy and peace are critical enablers for not only continental integration, but also for sustainable human development in Africa. 
The African governance architecture is also designed as a comprehensive, overarching and consolidated framework for addressing issues of governance and governance related challenges and aimed at inter alia addressing structural causes of political instability through uh, preventive diplomacy, mediation, negotiated settlement of conflicts, humanitarian assistance, and durable solutions. Also promoting reconciliation and post-conflict reconstruction and development. The African governance architecture and the African peace and security architecture acknowledge that democratic governance, peace and security are interrelated and mutually reinforcing imperatives. This thinking is also firmly rooted in our ongoing 2014-2017 strategic plan of the African Union, which has prioritized the promotion of peace and stability, good governance, democracy, and human rights as foundations for development and stable societies. It's also inspired by both the common African position that we are currently working on, on the post-2015 development agenda and the AU agenda 2063. In the long term, the African governance architecture strategy resonates with the African Union agenda 2063. Our vision is an Africa that influences and drives growth elsewhere on the globe. It's also an Africa that plays its rightful role in global affairs, including the governance reforms of major international institutions, such as the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, and the World Trade Organization. One of the key flagship initi initiatives of the African governance architecture is the annual high-level dialogue on democracy, governance, and human rights in Africa, which we started in 2012. This forum is one of our knowledge generation and dialogue series, which has proven to be extremely useful in providing a frank, open, and inclusive platform for our member states, African Union organs and institutions, regional economic communities, African citizens, think tanks, civil society, media, the private sector, philanthropists, and development actors to engage and share comparable experiences and lessons on how to promote good governance. This year, in light of the commitment by our African leaders during the 50th anniversary that was held last year, which made them, uh, which uh, as an outcome document, our leaders decided to make a declaration and uh, a principal component of this declaration is to silence the guns on the African continent by 2020. We are left with just six years to attain that goal. Thus, the theme for the 2014 high-level dialogue is silencing the guns, improving governance for preventing, managing, and resolving conflicts in Africa. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, a fully operationalized African governance architecture has significant implications for democratization, peace, and stability on the African continent. We call on all our partners, including the IPI, to continue to engage with the African governance architecture and support this initiative deliver the aspirations and hopes of our people. You may be interested to know that the aspirations of our people is uh, articulated clearly in what we call the Agenda 2063. And uh, I'll just list the seven categories that the agenda is premised upon, or is classified into. One is a prosperous Africa based on inclusive and environmentally sustainable growth. Two, an integrated, politically united Africa based on the ideals of Pan-Africanism. An Africa of good governance, 
respect for human rights, justice and the rule of law, a peaceful and secure Africa, an Africa with a strong cultural identity, values and ethics, an Africa whose development is people driven, especially relying on the potential offered by its youth and women, an Africa as a strong and influential global player and partner. Through the African governance architecture, the African Union Commission remains steadfast in the achievement of its mandate to contribute to the emergence of a political environment within an African countries, as well as the international level. That is conducive to bringing about sustainable development and accelerating the economic integration on the continent. And we look forward to all of you here joining us to ensure that uh, what we had set out to do are actualized. I sincerely thank you for your attention. Uh, the lunch hour is a very difficult hour, but um, I'm happy that uh, only if you have dosed off. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, uh, Ambassador Abdullahi, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation just now. And uh, the uh, goals that you have just articulated are very noble, are very democratic, are very inspirational. And I think it's impossible that anybody in this room would not agree with those goals. I think these are goals that we all share. Uh, and I think nobody's sort of naive to just think that overnight all these goals will be fulfilled. And this is a big challenge to realize these goals. But I want to just to start the conversation here, ask you two questions. Uh, one about civil society and one about the leaders of the 53 states of the African Union. So with regard to civil society, I, I give a class up at Columbia, and uh, I was discussing with my students uh, two years ago, actually, the disconnect between the African Union and the civil society, all these NGOs and human rights organizations and so on. And there was a young Australian a lawyer in the class, and she said that these goals, these documents, were lost in translation. That, that was kind of her phrase. In other words, she felt that the adoption of all these documents in sort of you know, high-level English language, abstractions, but real, but abstractions, human rights, democracy, elections, these are, you know, you, if you go into school, you understand these things, and if you've been educated with a liberal education, but many people, as we know, in Africa have not yet had that opportunity. So I'm wondering, first of all, what you think, whether you think there is a disconnect between civil society and the Union, African Union, and what can be done to narrow that gap. And then secondly, if I may, you know, a number of these leaders have been in power for 30 or 40 years. And they've hardly been committed to open, free, and fair elections. They've kind of organized these elections to assure their continuation in office. And then the outside comes in and declares it a free and fair election. But then nothing really changes much in these countries. And these leaders often simply take care of themselves. I mean, that's kind of my view. And I, I think it's a view that's widely held in the West. So I wonder whether you think there's a disconnect between these really major aspirations and the behavior of these leaders once they leave Addis Ababa and go back to their capitals. So I wonder if you could say something about those two points. Uh, and, and then I'm going to open this up to some others. Well, thank you very much for, for these um, questions. Um, the civil society first. Um, it's true. When we had the Organization of African Unity, the OAU, as it's properly um, it's known as, most of the activities of the OAU were just focusing 
on the governments and states. And the participation of the African citizenry was very low. One of the key or radical uh, transformations of our continental union from the Organization of African Unity to the African Union is the fact that uh, the AU has in its vision that it has to be people driven. So whatever activity that we do now in the African Union, the civil society is greatly involved. We have a directorate at the commission that's in charge of civil society and, and our citizens in diaspora. We also have ECOSOC. And their voices are getting louder and louder. You can see that the voices are not loud enough, but they are getting louder. And uh, we are seeing the immediate benefits because when you involve the people, there's ownership and uh, you intend, uh, you, you stand to you know, drive more from your set objectives. So it's really promoting ownership. We are not there yet, but we are getting there. Now on our sit tight leaders, um, in our 54, we are now 54 member states. You know, um, South Sudan has been created out of the, the Sudan <laughs> proper, so we have 54 member states. Yes. As I told you, increasingly we are having elections. Our task at the commission is to enhance the credibility of these elections. And uh, currently, we've changed the way we do business. In the past, we were just involved in short-term observation as the African Union. We'd go there maybe a week to the elections, and then um, have like a, just a superficial understanding of how the process go is going on. But now we have what we call long-term observation, where we have teams that remain on the ground for a minimum of two months. And it's really um, an expert team comprising um, different types of um, experts, experts in gender, experts in election administration, experts in conflict resolution. And, and, and they continuous, continuously uh, send us information at the commission. And depending on what we receive from them, we also try to do some uh, preventive diplomacy where necessary, and consequently, and increasingly, our elections on the continent are ceasing to become um, a source of conflict. Um, we have had elections in the past that had led to conflicts that like we had in Kenya, but uh, increasingly now we have had very peaceful elections. On whether they are perfect or not, I don't think there are perfect elections anywhere on the continent. But with all the challenges that we face as a continent, challenges of infrastructure, because you go out there, for example, now we, we use our computers. You go out there in the field, the computers could refuse to work. There would be no te technician to fix them. You could go out there in the field. There's no electricity to power the computers. So lots of challenges. But I, I would say to you with confidence that um, increasingly, increasingly, the quality, the credibility of our elections is improving. But then also, we have some situations. And I would not mention the country. For example, you, you have a president in some countries where the local people, the ordinary people, had no land. And he provides them with land. And it would be very difficult as long as that president is alive. Because for us, the land is everything. It's where we, it's our means of sustenance. It's our means of uh, livelihood. So as long as those presidents are alive, it's very difficult to get the people to vote them out. For them, it's like their lifeline. So there are such situations. So, and I, since I took over as a commissioner, I tried to be out there in the field myself. For example, in Kenya, I was there for 14 days observing the elections. I was also in Zimbabwe for 11 days. So I have had a lot of debates over the Zimbabwean election, but what I saw with my own eyes 
is that even if there are challenges, the elections reflect the will of the people. So um, this I would say to you as a quick response. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much. Also, your clarification that there are 54 states in the African Union now, I am happy to, to up the number. You know, the, uh, just as a quick parenthesis, the, for the current, I believe, uh, electoral commissioner in Sierra Leone, she was here about a year ago, and I remember her saying that the observer should be there for a year before the election because her mind was that all of the leveraging, the arm twisting, the compulsion, was happening long before election day. That election day was simply kind of the overt manifestation. And a lot of what was going on behind the scenes, in her case in Sierra Leone, had very little to do with election day. So I think two months is already a big step forward. But, and I realize this is all about resources, manpower, and finances. But a lot of the challenges of good elections have to do with events long before election day, which you yourself have just said. Um, I, let me invite two or three, if you could just get up and introduce yourself. So let's start with the gentleman right here, and then we'll go to Devin and over here, and I'll come back to you, Jeffrey. Could you also introduce yourself, your name, and where you're from, and also look at everybody so it's a kind of a two-way street here so Suddenly. they can all hear you? Suddenly. Thank you, Mr. Harsh. My name is Wally Idris Ajibade. I am the executive director of African Views Organization. It is wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for your time, Ambassador. Um, I want to start first by applauding the AGA. Question. Yes, it's coming to that. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you will be in Morocco in October for the launching of the African Law Library, which is one of the uh, important development of the AGA. I think it's something you should suddenly sing about here. Um, my question is in regards to the recent U.S.-Africa summit in, the, in Washington, D.C. Uh, the question is, given the fact that economic development in developed countries are driven by the well-established legal framework, and the opposite is true in Africa, that is, Economic development in those countries will drive the development of the legal regulatory framework. Now, to which principle and laws will business transaction between the United States and Africa, uh, to which principle and to which law will businesses abide when they do business with Africa? Thank you very much. I mean, the reason I just asked this gentleman to just ask a question is I want to get as many of you in as I can. So you all be kind of to the point. So Devin, please, and if you could again introduce yourself. Thanks. Um, I'm Devin Curtis. I'm a lecturer at the University of Cambridge and also here at IPI. This is my first day at IPI. First um, day here, but we know. Thanks it. very much for, for the presentation. My question really has to do with this link between democratic governance and effective governance. And I was wondering, what do you see about democratic governance that makes it effective governance? And I'm interested in that because a lot of the countries that are doing very well in Africa at the moment, if we think about Ethiopia, Rwanda, Angola, Eritrea, are at least you could say dubious democracies. And so do you think that it's something that comes later or does political stability come first in democracy later? Fantastic. And we'll take one more question right now. Could you just stand yeah. up and introduce yeah, yourself? Yeah, Eldon Yearly, International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. I was tempted to ask you about the international in criminal court relationship with AU, but uh, because of the Ebola crisis that I think it, it brings health issues that are cutting issues for Africa, would you comment on those? You know, those of you who haven't seen it, David Brooks' article today in the New York Times describes the Ebola crisis as a crisis of governance, exactly. of bad governance, exactly. not having good health systems. <laughs> Ambassador. Okay. Thank you very much for this handful. Um, um, the African Law Library, we await the invitation. If we can make it, uh, we shall surely um, be there. 
on the Africa-US um, meeting, Africa leaders US meeting, it's not Africa US, Africa leaders US meeting, and their laws and principles. Uh, one that comes to my mind is the Africa mining vision. Um, it's, it's one uh, framework that could be quite helpful, but uh, we have, um, we're developing other instruments and norms uh, to ensure that uh, what we have in Africa as an abundance trickles down to the people, that's actually the major goals, but um, I could provide you with a list of the comprehensive instruments later. Now on this question about democratic governance and effective governance, and this whole question of the importance of democracy. You know, somebody played the devil's advocate and made mention of a country, not in Africa, in Asia, Thailand. Thailand has been going through a lot of military coups, but still the growth rate, the economy is still booming. So that's one example. It's not just peculiar to Africa. The examples that you listed in Africa are also true. Uh, Ethiopia is currently enjoying um, a rapid uh, growth rate more due to visionary leadership than the actual practice of true democracy. But we feel that if we can have that leadership, but then have real participatory democracy, the growth rate would have been doubled. Well, we have 11, we could have like 21, and uh, so be it. Uh, yes, there are challenges. Yes, our democracies are not perfect democracies. Yes, we have autocratic regimes that are doing very well on the continent, more due to natural resources. And I said earlier in my presentation that really when you look, look at the big picture, it may appear promising. But when you look down at the smaller picture, issues to do with decentralization. It's a big challenge on the continent. Yes, these countries are now you know, getting a lot of money, a lot of resources, but when you look at the other indices, the social indices, it's still very low. And it's only proper democracy that can address these issues of local governance and decentralization, because it's when the people elect their proper leaders that are responsible and they know there are core problems that these issues can be properly addressed. But it's, it's yeah, it's, it's very, it's worth reflecting over. And uh, I, shall, I shall put it uh, to my team to debate further on this. Now, on the issue of the ICC, uh, Madam, 34 out of our 54 member states are state parties to the International Criminal Court. And um, the US is not, for example. <laughs> so at least as African countries, we have signed up. <laughs> we have ratified. <laughs> we have made the very first steps. Um, yes, there, there were cries from all over, especially from the African continent, that the ICC is focusing more on African leaders. Um, there was that debate for most part of the second half of last year, but I think now the debate has died down. For us, we have signed, we have ratified, and it's an African woman that's the president of the ICC. And somebody asked me some time ago when she was um, appointed that, um, what, uh, Chief Prosecutor, sorry, Chief Prosecutor, thank you for correcting me, Beb Fatima Bensouda. The president is President Tina Inhelham. In Hel in Helmania, from Estonia, sorry. They asked me about the chief prosecutor, that what do you expect from her? I said, we expect nothing from her but justice and fair play. Far to be Suda been there, we don't expect her to keep a blind eye to atrocities on the African continent, and I think she has not put us to shame. 
So we have signed, we have ratified, and we shall continue to respect the jurisdiction of the ICC. Thank you. Now on the Ebola crisis, this is also one crisis uh, that's exposing our weak infrastructure on the continent. The worst hit countries, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea are countries that are coming out of conflict. Their infrastructure is very weak. They're also faced with endemic corruption, even though they are rich, extremely rich, in terms of natural resources. If you compare the situation in Nigeria, for example, which, had, which has sounder infrastructure, the issue, uh, the challenge was curbed in a very short period of time compared to the situation in those countries. But currently, Guinea has sort of stabilized. Sierra Leone is improving a bit. The worst crisis we are experiencing is in uh, Liberia. And uh, only um, last week, about two weeks ago, we had uh, an emergency extraordinary meeting of all our ministers of foreign affairs and health to look closely at the Ebola crisis because it's a crisis that's not only affecting the lives of the African people, but our economies. Um, people, uh, most countries, most companies are stopping their international flights to these uh, countries. The GDP growth of most of our member states has fallen down between two to 3% during this crisis period. And we feel concerned that this is not the first time that the world is faced with an epidemic. We had the avian flu recently, but um, I mean, these countries did not suffer as much as we are suffering on the African continent. Uh, we, we are doing all we could as the African Union to respond rapidly to the epidemic. Uh, we have asked our member states to at least allow us to fly among ourselves. Because many Afri every day we, you wake up one country, even today I read that uh, Gabon and Chad have closed their borders to citizens from these countries. So we are doing a lot of diplomacy with these countries to ensure that they enhance their sc screening at the airports rather than stop people uh, from entering these countries. So, so these are some of the measures that are being taken, but it's, I think Ebola as a disease is a terrible, terrible epidemic. People compare it to the HIV AIDS, but it's worse because um, the, the, the virus can survive outside the host for 23 days. The HIV AIDS virus can only survive outside the host for about 30 minutes. And so uh, the level of contamination is extremely, extremely high, and we hope that we can curb it. Thank you very much. Well, it's a challenge, obviously, for all the states in the entire world. So we're going to end at 2.30, so I hope we all stay together. So we're going to have one last round here. We're going to have Jeffrey, the gentleman in the fourth or fifth row there, this lady. And if we can get you in, short questions, very short questions. Jeffrey. Okay, uh, Jeff Laurenti and Ambassador Abdullahi, you didn't have to apologize about talking through our lunch. IPI does a good job keeping us here for that. Um, a, a very technical question and a political one. The technical one is, what are the resources that your department has from assessments on member states and from international aid agencies, and how much do you actually put in, on the ground into countries? And then the political question, going to the strong men who are convinced of their own indispensability that John uh, had referred to, uh, most African countries do not have a single dominant ethnic group but are multi-ethnic. And as you pointed out in your answer to an earlier question, uh, it is these ethnically divided electorates that create often, uh, that make of elections more conflict rather than less. Do you have in your experience any set of institutional fixes? What kind of democratic structures better, work better to overcome and allow for knitting together multi-ethnic societies and which tend to become more divisive. Great, so the gentleman right there, yes. And again, introduce Hi. yourself. 
Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Serge Capto. I'm uh, the focal point for governance in the UNDP team on post-2015. I'm going to come back to one of the issues that was alluded earlier, uh, to ask specifically uh, if there are some mechanisms in the African governance architecture for a more participatory approach uh, at the local level in between electoral times. I mean, you spoke about uh, staying in the country for two months, uh, but we've heard that uh, the issues happen way before elections. And in our countries, it's very uh, easy for the, uh, the people in power to subvert elections anyway for their own benefits. Uh, in my country in particular, we have a saying, it's a soccer crazy country. And we say there that, that the host country or the organizing country never loses the game. And that's a saying about elections. So are there mechanisms uh, in uh, the African governance architecture to engage citizens with the governments more closely in between elections? in the governing affairs of the country. Very uh, good, very good. Okay, let, let me just pass the microphone on to another. We're not gonna, we're gonna run out of time. So please, with all respect, uh, the, the lady right here. Hi, uh, I'm Harriet Mandel of uh, the Global Roundtable. My question is about regionalism, oh, sorry, uh, is about regionalism generally. I know that's a study now at the United Nations and in academia, and there are limitations as well as opportunities. Um, I remember the days of Nasser and the Pan-Arab movement, and it was a heady time, and the whole thing disintegrated. Could you just address that issue in lessons learned as well as the issue of sovereignty, which is built into uh, some of the structures that you mentioned? Okay, so those will be the wrap up questions so you can consolidate your answers as you like. Um, yeah, about strong men and <laughs> indispensability and uh, what we could do to promote uh, democratization, and also the issue of ethnicity. Um, most of our countries are multi-ethnic, and uh, in most countries we have had few ethnic groups holding on to power, but um, I had to do this always, but I would give an example with what Nigeria has done to ensure that every ethnic group is represented. Nigeria comprises um, over 250 ethnic groups. And in order to ensure that um, power rotates, they had set up what they call the Federal Character Commission. The Federal Character Commission ensures that all appointments, all recruitments, in the civil service uh, done on an equitable manner, but also in a way to promote merit. Um, the issue of merit has been put to challenge because in some cases, decision makers have had to choose people over others based on complex considerations, not just purely merit. Um, where we have three candidates, for example, for three different posts, and those that came first all come from one ethnic group or one region, uh, attempts are made to skew it in such a way that uh, the other ethnic groups are not disregarded. It's a very um, radical um, decision, but it's a decision that has helped us as Nigerians, I'm not talking as Nigerian, not as an African, to, to remain united. Because Nigeria went civil, through civil war in the late 60s to the early 70s, and these are deliberate measures that were made to ensure that Nigeria does not uh, resort back to that uh, disintegrated state. So that's just one example that would come to mind. But also Kenya currently is trying to exercise the evolution of powers in order to ensure that um, the gains they've made on having uh, elections that are accepted by the people are not uh, compromised. Now, on the African governance architecture, 
and the commission going to observe elections now two months earlier. I wish we could be there throughout the electoral cycle, but it's a very expensive business. It's very expensive business, and I would now link it to the question, the technical question on resources. I would have had to say, our operational budget is 100% funded by the member states. But our program budget, over 99% of it is funded by partners. And this has been an issue of concern to us, that even for our pride as an African people, as African peoples, that this must change. So we have a committee headed by President Obasanjo, former president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, that's currently working on alternative sources of funding for the union through taxes, through levies, through whatever means to ensure that Africa funds its projects more and more. We still need our partners, but we want our partners to help us in such a way that we can stand in our feet, that someday, someday, this dream that we have of an independent, peaceful, prosperous, integrated continent can be realized. So this is about the technical question that you, you asked to me. We are concerned about that um, uh, weight that our partners uh, are helping us to shoulder for now. But uh, we hope it would change uh, in the due course. The last question on regionalism and sovereignty, I didn't get it very well. But um, maybe you, you, you got it? Well, sort of uh, how effective are regional institutions in promoting democratization? You know, the, the, the RECs, so we have EGAD or ECOWAS, yeah. so you've adopted all these instruments at the continental level, but is there resonance at the regional level? I think that's sort of the thrust of your question. Well, all I could say to this is, is that it's resonating. We have eight regional economic communities that you recognize. Um, some of the membership, uh, there's a lot of overlap. For example, those in the eastern region, um, they could either be in IGAD, or in the Afri East African community, or in COMESA. So um, it's not that uh, each member state uh, belongs to just one unique and distinct regional economic community. Or in the western part of Africa, where you have our countries belonging to ECOWAS, but also being members of CENSAD. For now, we are tolerating the du duplication or um, the um, double or multiple participation in the RECs. But the aim is to ensure that we use these regional economic communities as our building blocks to get to the people. Whether we are doing that perfectly, I would not say yes. Every day in all our activities, we try to advocate that our regional economic communities are important and they are more close to the African peoples than we are at the headquarters in Addis Ababa and that that is becoming stronger and stronger as we move along. So uh, you uh, said near the outset that this is a work in progress. Yes. And you know, really on behalf of all of us, I personally think you're an inspirational individual in the role you're playing right now, as well as the roles you played earlier. And I think everything, the trajectory that you've outlined here and your own commitment to it, or really the, the direction of the future, or I hope they're the direction of the future. We have students who come here from Africa every summer, and we've met a number of them, and they share, I think, the values you've articulated. So on behalf of everybody in the room, I want to thank you very much again for being with us, for the direction you have outlined for the African Union, and really for the people of Africa. So uh, let's give Ambassador Abdullahi a big hand here.